Hi, this is David Klein from the NYU Langone Orthopedic Hospital, Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine. I'll be presenting a case on the open surgical decompression of a piriformis syndrome. I'd like to thank my co-authors. And we also have no relevant disclosures to this presentation. Piriformis syndrome is an uncommon cause of posterior hip and buttock pain. Common differential diagnoses include lumbar radiculopathy, femoral impingement, gluteal strain, hamstring strain, and any cause of intrinsic or extrinsic sciatic nerve lesion. All causes of posterior hip pain should be ruled out before making a diagnosis of piriformis syndrome. Since the studies looking at piriformis syndrome are somewhat heterogeneous and poor, and there are so many differential diagnoses of deep gluteal pain, all of these differential diagnoses must be considered. In our experience, which is somewhat limited, open surgical decompression for piriformis syndrome has produced good outcomes in well-indicated patients, and we do consider this to be purely a clinical diagnosis of exclusion. Anatomically, the sciatic nerve courses under the piriformis muscle belly, as you can see in this picture, and an enlarged piriformis muscle can place pressure on the sciatic nerve. The surgical approach we use is a standard posterior approach similar to what is done for arthroplasty, where the gluteus maximus is split within its fibers and the piriformis tendon is exposed. Piriformis tendon is then transected and allowed to retract. We then find the sciatic nerve and assure that there's no undue pressure or tension on the nerve. In this study from 1938, uh, we do know that there are many anatomic variations of the sciatic nerve. Most commonly, the entire nerve passes under the belly of the piriformis muscle. However, the second most common anatomic variant does have the nerve being split by a bifid piriformis muscle belly. The hypertrophic piriformis muscle belly places pressure on the nerve, causing pain or causing distal neurologic symptoms. And a split piriformis uh, muscle belly can place tension on the nerve as it contracts. In our case, we have a 48-year-old female. She has had 10 years of right-sided hip pain with no inciting injury. She's also two-year status post to right hip arthroscopic labral repair, cam and pincer resection, and iliopsoas release. She's also undergone several years of PT, injections to the piriformis muscle belly, injections to the hip joint, and greater trochanteric bursa, and yet she continues to complain of pain localizing to the buttock and greater trochanter. On physical exam, we found marked tenderness at the ischium along the path of the piriformis tendon. There's also tenderness at the hamstring insertion and the greater trochanter. Notably, pain was reproduced on external rotation of the hip. She did have normal range of motion, and she was neurovascularly intact distally. On imaging, the piriformis muscle belly is seen on axial MRI. The purple arrows outline the muscle belly of the piriformis. For treatment options and decision making, treatment should always begin with conservative management consisting of physical therapy and non anti-inflammatories. Selective injections in and around the hip joint can also be therapeutic and diagnostic. Injections can be done into the hip joint itself, into the piriformis muscle belly, and into the greater trochanteric bursa. We have found very good results with ultrasound-guided botulinum toxin injections to the piriformis muscle belly which creates a chemical denervation of the muscle and stops it from compressing the nerve. In this study from August of 2017, a randomized control trial of botulinum toxin plus physical therapy versus placebo plus physical therapy showed significant improvements in visual analog scale of pain and electrodiagnostic testing in a, the patient group that received botulinum toxin injected into their piriformis tendon. We recommend a trial of injection prior to surgical management. The indications to proceed with surgery is a patient who has failed extensive non-operative management. Patients should undergo at least 6 to 12 months of conservative management including physical therapy and injections and rest prior to surgery. Potential complications include infection, sciatic nerve injury, and continued pain. Also there can be mild scar tenderness. For the surgical technique, the patient is positioned in the lateral decubitus position on a standard OR table. A posterior approach to the hip is made. The piriformis tendon is isolated and released. Following tendon release, the sciatic nerve is examined to make sure that there is no further compression on the nerve. Also, a dynamic 
range of motion test is done to assure that there's no impingement of the greater trochanter against the sciatic nerve. A partial greater trochanteric resection can be performed if necessary. This is followed by a layered closure. Patient is placed in the lateral decubitus position with all bony prominence as well padded and draped. Surgical incision is then marked. We mark out the greater trochanter by palpating the tip of the greater trochanter and then mar marking the anterior and posterior edges of it. The incision is a standard posterior approach to the hip based on the posterior one-third of the greater trochanter, extending approximately four finger breaths proximal and distal to the tip of the greater trochanter. Skin incision is made and dissection is carried down through the subcutaneous fat, maintaining hemostasis throughout. The surgeon is standing on the posterior side of the patient with the assistant standing on the anterior side. The left side of the screen is toward the head of the patient and the right side of the screen is toward the foot. Following this, a elevator is used to elevate the subcutaneous fat from the iliotibial band overlying the greater trochanter. The greater trochanter is palpated and the IT band is incised in line with its fibers using electrocautery. At this point, it's helpful to have retractors to aid in visualization so a full incision through the IT band can be made. A finger is placed, as you can see here, to make defining the IT band a little bit easier so the bovi doesn't wander into the muscle belly of, the, of um, gluteus maximus. Blunt dissection is then continued to elevate the gluteus maximus and the IT band as a single sleeve from the underlying bursa. A charnally retractor is then placed under the IT band anteriorly and posteriorly, and the bursa overlying the external rotators is resected. The resection starts at the posterior edge of the greater trochanter so that the dissection doesn't wander toward the sciatic nerve. Once the bursa is resected, the short external rotators can be located and visualized. Superiorly, the gluteus medius tendon is seen, usually overlying the piriformis tendon. After opening the interval between gluteus medius and the piriformis tendon, a Hohmann retractor is going to be placed against the ilium to retract gluteus medius. This will give you very clear visualization of the piriformis tendon. At this point, you can see the piriformis tendon, the capsule above it, gluteus medius, and the short external rotators below the piriformis tendon. The piriformis tendon is then isolated using electrocautery and released. Care is taken not to release any of the other external rotators or to buttonhole into the capsule. After release, the tendon tends to retract forcefully. After releasing the piriformis tendon, the hip is taken through a range of motion to assess for any trochanteric impingement. If necessary, a reduction osteotomy is performed of the greater trochanter to reduce any impinging bone. The greater trochanter is palpated. The hip is then taken through its range of motion. External rotation is done to assess for impingement of the greater trochanter. In this case, we did find some impingement. The soft tissues were then elevated over the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter, and a rongeur was used to resect a small amount of bone from the posterior facet of the greater trochanter. After completing the resection, bone wax can be placed against the bleeding bone edge to reduce any chance for further bleeding. A final range of motion is then performed to assure that there's no further trochanteric impingement, and the sciatic nerve is then assessed to ensure both its continuity and to assure that there's no further impinging lesions upon the nerve. The wounds then irrigated and closed in layers using heavy vipral suture in interrupted fashion. We also make sure to close the subcutaneous fat and layers to make sure there's no chance of hematoma formation. 
Skin is then closed using absorbable monocryl suture, and stereostrips are placed, followed by a watertight dressing. Postoperatively, patients are maintained non-weight bearing with crutches until the sutures are removed at their two-week post-op visit. We then begin physical therapy with weight bearing as tolerated for six weeks. We give aspirin for four weeks for DVT prophylaxis, and we found that prophylaxis for heterotopic ossification is not necessary. Make sure to identify the sciatic nerve after release to make sure that there has been complete release and that there's no further impinging lesion. Patients should also be sure to exhaust at least 6 to 12 months of conservative management prior to going on with surgery. Although there are no long-term prospective blinded trials of piriformis release, several series do exist. Patients with post-traumatic piriformis syndrome tend to do well with release. In other series, most patients do see an improvement of pain of greater than 50% of their preoperative symptoms. However, a subset of patients does continue to have pain and disability. This is seen in most series showing that patients must be very well indicated for this procedure prior to proceeding with surgery. This has been David Klein presenting a case of open release of piriformis syndrome at the NYU Langone Orthopedic Hospital Division of Sports Medicine. Thanks for listening, and we hope this video helps you in your practice.